So, but I want to start here because, I mean, you've had a really interesting career. You, you um, when I met you, you and Tony were both basically war correspondents, mm -hmm. right? You, if it was the first Gulf War, you were flying in and out, you were writing. I mean, I'm not just flattering you. The stuff was unbelievably good. You were, you were, you won Pulitzer prizes for it. It was, and it was, it was. You were really good at that, um, and you were being rewarded for that. And it surprised me that you took this turn out of out of daily journalism and into this. And says says the man who left a well-paying job on yeah, Wall Street. You don't know that's true, but 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 um, and. Uh, and I can remember, I mean, the nonfiction, the, the nonfiction books were all great, but when you first published, I think it was Year of Wonders, right? That was the mm -hmm. first novel, yeah. historical novel. I mean, it was like watching, it, it was like a, watching the dog walk on its hind legs. <laughs> I, that I just thought, she can do that too? Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was, I mean, it was kind of amazed how good it was. And uh, all your books, they're absolutely riveting and absolutely persuasive, set in a completely different place. But I want to go back to, because there will be people here who are interested in how these careers start. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, why leave what you were doing so well, and why do this? Like, how did uh, this happen? So, I have the Nigerian secret police to thank all right. for this. So, I was reporting a story about how Shell Oil was in cahoots with the um, military dictatorship of Sani Abacha and um, they had called for uh, him to send the army in basically to slaughter a bunch of peaceful farmers who were protesting the exploitation that had been going on for 35 years in the region around Port Harcourt. So I did what you do as a journalist. I went, I went around and I, you know, I didn't actually, I, I, I didn't think that it could possibly be true that a major oil company would do this stuff, but I went, to the region, and uh, I found it was actually worse than had been described, and I was there right after a massacre had occurred, and the evidence was everywhere, so you collect the evidence, and then you do, what you do as a good journalist is you go and get the other side of the story, so I turned up at the military headquarters to say, why did you slaughter all these unarmed people? <laughs> and that didn't go very well. <laughs> <laughs> So they handed me over to the secret police and they threw me in the lockup in Port Harcourt and I'm lying there on the concrete floor and I'm thinking of all the reporters I know who've been in a, hostages or imprisoned and thinking how long and thinking of Terry Anderson and eight years chained to a radiator and I thought, eight years, holy cow, I forgot to get pregnant. If they keep me for eight years, I've completely <laughs> blown it. So I was extremely lucky, and I was deported after only three days. And so I got home, and I greeted Tony with great enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and our son was born the following year. Right. But this left me with a problem, because I no longer had a great appetite for going off on long, open-ended assignments to places where you might get thrown in the slammer or worse. And I needed a new gig. And I thought, that's okay, I'll, I'll freelance, I'll do celebrity profiles, but hey, if you've been a war correspondent, nobody thinks of you to go and sit by a swimming pool and interview George Clooney. No. <laughs> they keep ringing and saying, would you like to go with the Pashtun across the mountains into Afghanistan? And I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> covered in baby throw up and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do not want to do that right now. So. I had this idea that had been banging around in my head ever since we'd lived in London and uh, on a hiking weekend stumbled into this village where the bubonic plague had come in 1665 and the villagers had taken the unique decision to voluntarily quarantine themselves. And so they lived in lockdown for a year. And how that had come about, how they came to that consensus and what it was like living through it. It had been something I'd been thinking about ever since I'd been there, so that I decided to sit down and see if I could write it. And lucky for me, somebody wanted to read it, so. Well, so, <laughs> but go back to this moment. Did it feel preposterous that you, were, that you were going to write a historical novel, or did it seem natural to you? It seemed unlikely that it would work. Yeah. 
I but, thought so too. But I just got a nice, yeah, <laughs> I just got a nice award in Australia for my second book. And it's a particular award that is given to encourage women writers. And it came with a nice check. I think it was like $40,000. So I was extremely encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> and I decided that I would use that money to buy some time and see if I could do this thing. So I just wrote three chapters. And I sent it to my agent, my nonfiction agent. And I didn't hear from her. And I thought, oh, well, so it, sh it stank. <laughs> and she's too nice to tell me. <laughs> And then, you know, it's about seven weeks, six, seven weeks later, she calls and said, guess what? I sold your book. Oh. And then I had to write the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you say to yourself, did you feel like this is really what I was, what I should be doing? Well, I, I loved journalism, you know, and I... I you were so good at it. I would have kept doing uh, yeah. that, you know. But I, for me, it wasn't. I just read a really wonderful story in the Wall Street Journal by a, a young reporter who went with um, Biden into Kiev the other day, and she had to leave her nine-month-old baby that she's breastfeeding behind to do that. Yeah. And the difficulties of pumping breast milk on a closed train yeah. going across Poland into a war zone. And I thought, I, I really admire women who make that choice, but that wasn't the choice I wanted. I wanted my kids to have the same kind of childhood I had, which was my mother was around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about, <laughs> a, hor let's talk about a horse a little bit. All right. Know, because, um, how does it start? How do you, 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 Year of Wonders starts with you wandering into this village and seeing the, what, what triggers your interest that leads to the riding of horse? Well, this came about because I, I didn't grow up around horses. I, I lived in the inner city in Sydney when I was growing up and we didn't have a lot of money so the ho whole horse girl thing, it didn't even enter my consciousness. But um, so I was at a writer's retreat in Santa Fe in 2011 uh -huh. and it was on a ranch and my room happened to overlook the horse corral and they're beautiful and I love animals so I was just admiring them as beautiful animals, and one of the wranglers said, you should come for a ride. Uh, we're going on a trail ride. And I said, I can't ride. And he said, doesn't matter. These horses know their job. They won't let you fall off. And so I went on this ride, and it was an ecstatic experience. And we were actually cantering along cliff edges, and it just seemed like, oh my gosh, how have I got to 53 years of age and never done this? So I got home to Martha's Vineyard, and a week later, a young friend came over for dinner. And she, uh, I, I was telling her how wonderful this was, and she said, you know what? You've got a few acres here. You could have a horse. In fact, I could give you my horse. <laughs> That's a gift horse. A free horse! <laughs> it's a gift horse. You went and looked at, looked at its mouth? I couldn't look in its mouth because this horse was not close by. Right. This horse was in Mexico, <laughs> <laughs> which gave me time to sign up for riding lessons and fence half my property and convert the tool shed into a stalls. And, but it didn't matter that this was all very complicated and very expensive for a free horse because this was a beautiful horse. And I knew that because the horse was in a commercial. And it was a commercial for a fast-acting antifungal cream to treat vaginal yeast infections. Yeah. <laughs> Which, of course, you need a horse for. <laughs> well, Palomino mare gallops across the Mexican Altiplano, and the voiceover says, some things should be fast. <laughs> It was that horse? It was that, that horse. That very horse. My that my so it's a celebrity palomino. horse. It was Mantiquilla, the beautiful Mexican Palomino. So she arrived, and I was obsessed. Did Nobody she? could find me. I was either on the horse in the woods, in the riding ring, learning to be a better rider, talking to the farrier, talking to the saddle fitter, arranging the horse masseur. And there's a lot of income flowing out. <laughs> and no writing being done. My bum was not in the chair. <laughs> and I was saved from total family insolvency by the complete coincidence of being invited to a donor's lunch at Plymouth Pawtuxet Museum. And they'd been very helpful to me when I was researching Caleb's Crossing. So I was glad to come and help them out by being chum in the water for the donors. 
<laughs> yeah. And I'm sitting there being, making polite chit chat with donors. And down the table is a guy from the Smithsonian Institution, and he's regaling his seatmates with the story of how he's just delivered the skeleton of the best racehorse of the 19th century from an attic in the Natural History Museum to the centerpiece of an exhibition on the history of the thoroughbred in Kentucky at the International Museum of the Horse. And then he gets to the bit about what happened to this horse during the Civil War. And my donors no longer have a scintilla of my attention. <laughs> and my food is uneaten. And I'm leaning across the table, because I knew that was my next book. Give us a little bit, well, what was it about that? What did he tell us a little bit about what happened to the horse during the Civil War? Well, I'm not going to tell you about that, because you have to read the oh, book okay. for oh. that. But it was, it, was, it was tense and dramatic, and yet. What, what, what was it that caught your attention? I, what I'm trying to get at it is like, when does the penny drop for you? Well, as soon as he started talking about the best racehorse of the 19th century, and I'd never heard of this horse, in a time period which I am familiar with because of previous book, March. Yeah. And so it's, uh, I, can, I can sense the setting. And, you know, and then the beautiful thing about it is that what happened to the horse in the Civil War ended up all right for the horse, mm -hmm. because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to write the book. So it was a, a horse story with a happy ending for the horse. So your first character that you know you have is the horse. The, just the horse. That was what I was going to write about, was just the horse. Who was, what was the dialogue going to be like? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine. Did, did it worry you a little bit? No. Was it be a talking horse? No, because, because there was inherent drama around the, the, the story of the, the, the greatness of the horse as an unparalleled speedster with incredible stamina and heart, and I knew that. And I knew that the horse had been a great celebrity. I knew that racing was completely different in um, the 19th century. So over four miles, so it's much more tactical. And the horses have to be strong as well as fast. And so there's all this stuff to work with, but I had no idea all the other directions that this book was going to go in. I knew I was interested in the science at the Smithsonian, so I thought, great, I've got the framing device of a contemporary story at the Smithsonian around, I'll be able to get up in somebody's business and find out how scientists study bones and you know yep. stuff that I love to do, and make a contemporary mystery story around what had happened to the horse, and then we'll, go, we'll have the narrative spine of the book. But when I went to the Smithsonian to learn about osteo prep work, I also found out that there was an art side to the story. And you and I have in common that we were both art history majors. I'd forgotten that about you. And I'd never had a chance to really, you know, I know all this stuff about uses of tempera and quattrocento and you don't really take those, But you also don't take those horse pictures seriously. As a, but, they, but they are lovely, these. Well, they're very, they're very accomplished paintings. Yeah. And they're important because this was how you advertised your horse in those days. They didn't have photography. So the horse, the equestrian artists were real experts in horse ph physiology. So you can tell exactly what those horses were like because these were the advertising flyers, essentially, by which you advertised your horse's stud services and so forth. Right, right. <laughs> so you have a situation first and a character in the form of a horse. And you can imagine that there's a character, a contemporary character in the Smithsonian who you're going to repurpose for your own uses. Who's the first historical human uh, that walks into, the, into your imagination? Well, that was the thing, because I didn't have any idea about the role of the black horseman. But this huge national obsession, a bit like NFL today, right, was built on the talent and skill of black accomplished uh, equestrian experts. They were the jockeys, they were the trainers, and most essentially, they were the grooms. Because if you have horses, you realize that's who the horse cares about, is the person that's there in the morning with the bucket of grain and mucking out the stall and um, bathing the legs and doing all the work. And that's whose footfall the horse recognizes. So I knew it would be the groom, and there happens to be a painting of Lexington, the horse, at the end of his life. And the title of the painting is Lexington being led out by Black Jarrett, his groom. And so then I realized that he would be the character. 
how did you get to know him? So that was hard because I while the horse, is, the horse's life is extremely well documented because he was such a celebrity and there were three newspapers at the time devoted to covering the affairs of the track. And so every race is documented second by second. And when this horse died, his obituary ran over three broadsheet pages. So there's a lot, a lot about the horse and very little about the enslaved black trainers whose plundered labor. Was there anything? Yes. What was there? So um, there's a, a couple of first person narratives by trainers who are interviewed in the, in the time period because they were respected. Mm -hmm. But you have to take those with a grain of salt because the interlocutor is white, so they're not telling everything for sure. Mm -hmm. But then the thing that was really arresting to me was you find these men, and they were all men of course, in the letters of the thoroughbred owners. And these guys talk about their horsemen in a way that they don't talk about any other enslaved person. Huh. With respect, and deference. Hmm. And that was really interesting and that led me into looking more closely at the role these men played. And they had a very unusual position in that they were able to accumulate wealth in their own name, which was supposed to not happen. And um, they also had a freedom of movement that other enslaved people didn't have because they were often charged with moving the horse from state to state for the races and so forth. Hmm. When, you're, when you are um, inventing a past um, and it's rubbing up against a contemporary story that, mm. you, that you've kind of reported, right? I mean, you're in the Smithsonian, you're, but you have more, I mean, it's, you have more to work with uh, mm. when you're dealing in the present. Does your, do you feel a difference when you're writing it? Do you feel that those scenes that are set in the 19th century feel different when you're writing it than the scenes that are set now? Well, I would say that you don't have to work for it as much. I mean, you have to do, not world building, but you have to re, you have to be able to revisit. But when your bum is in the chair. When your bum is in the do chair. Do you feel differently writing those scenes than the scenes that are in contemporary life? Yeah, because the scenes in contemporary life are in your own head. You know how people talk. Uh -huh. You don't have to fi figure out what, they, what word they would have used for this thing or that thing. Right. Um, which is very important to me to get that right, to get the diction of the past right. right and accurate to the time and place. So I do a lot of work on that. Well, I don't have to do that if I've got an Australian osteopreparator who came to the US for <laughs> graduate school. That was convenient. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to give myself a break here because I had <laughs> all these characters that were quite difficult, you know, and very interesting. I mean, this horse's connections had such vivid stories. The artist who painted him became a medic in the Civil War. His owners, uh, w the first one was uh, the Mary Todd Lincoln's, she, the, the obstetrician who delivered Mary Todd Lincoln, um, whose son-in-law was Cassius Clay, who was the charismatic um, emancipationist who survived three assassination attempts. And, and then Tenbrook. Who, well, let's talk about Tenbrook. Yeah. I, I, my goal is for the three panels I'm moderating to get to the New Orleans angle <laughs> in each story. Yeah. And each story actually has a New Orleans angle, and yeah. yours does too. Yes. Which I did not know. Yeah. Uh, tell us about Tenbrook. Tenbrook was the son of a very esteemed uh, New York Dutch family who um, went off to West Point and got himself embroiled in a scandal that le led to his withdrawal and being cast out of his family. And I schlepped all the way to West Point to get to the bottom of this scandal and they had nothing on it, Ooh. which was very disappointing. <laughs> but, you know, this, this, this happens. Um, and then uh, he becomes a riverboat gambler and he makes a fortune and with it he buys thoroughbreds and then he buys a racetrack, and it was Metairie. And he turned Metairie into the greatest racetrack in America. And the Metairie racetrack is now, what is it now, a cemetery? cemetery. Yeah, that's yes. right. I think my ancestors are buried there. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that was where it was. That was where it was. And then he buys Lexington. And he is such an incredible entrepreneur and showman. And he builds the rivalry between Lexington and a horse called Le Comte. And 30,000 people come to the track to watch these. To the Metairie racetrack. Yeah. And so Lexington was a New Orleanian for a while. He 
was all his great races happened right here. Huh. Yeah. And the whole town would close down. Apparently, that the, there was a shell road made of crushed shells that led out to Metairie. And apparently, it was so thick with carriages trying to get to the track that it was the traffic jam from hell. And people would just abandon their horses and carriages and walk. And they were hanging from the trees. Yeah. And, you know, it was, it was huge and exciting. And the two guys, the two owners, so Tenbrook, revved up this rivalry with a guy called Wells from the Red River. And they went at it in the press against each other and they enacted this rivalry through their horses. And Tenbrook's always outwitting Wells. And in the end, when Wells refuses to let his horse race again against Lexington, Tenbrook has the brilliant idea that Lexington will race against LeCompte's best time. So it's called the race against time. And people showed up to watch a horse run against a clock, which was extraordinary. <laughs> and is, did, was this, there's some connection to the invention of the stop. Yes. Stop. So they needed to be able to measure time in fractions of a second. Right. And they didn't have a mass produced one until these, ra these, these match races because people wanted to time the horses themselves. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so what was here when you came? Did, did I assume? You came here and you kind of looked around and see what you could find about the Metairie racetrack. Yeah, what, there wasn't a lot. It, it, it was, it's okay, though, <laughs> because so many people wrote so vividly about New Orleans at that time. So even though there's not... You have to imagine what Metairie was like sure. when it wasn't a cemetery. And it's a bit the same in Kentucky, unfortunately. You have to imagine this gorgeous horse farm where the horse was foaled because now it's a subdivision. <laughs> but luckily for us, you know, people wrote beautifully in those days. The literacy level was so much higher. And you see that in even the, even the letters of common soldiers during the Civil War. They are so articulate and they're, they're just, they love the language in a way that our tweets don't quite <laughs> measure up to. <laughs> um. But when you but did you come down here and oh, do yeah. archival? Where, where, and where where do you go? Where, where, what's the archival research? Oh well, no, the archival research, uh, the, the papers that. What's were left of the Metairie racetrack? There's nothing left of Metairie no. racetrack. The archives, the best archives are at the Beinecke at Yale. Okay. Oh really? Oh, they have a they have a huge collection on the history of horse racing, and that's where all the good stuff is. <laughs> Talk a little bit. We're going to open this up for questions in just a minute. Uh, but talk a little bit about the difference between making it up and getting the actual historical information. Like, like, you don't have to go find out what actually happened. Oh, but you're crazy if you don't, because it's usually better. And why is <laughs> that, That's true. And that's also true about, like, when you go out into the world and just report a story, you find things that you, you, you never, you would never imagine, you know, the imagination would not generate. And Mark Twain said it. Mark Twain said, fiction is required to stick to possibilities, truth isn't. Right. That's right. <laughs> Can we talk about what you're working on? No! I want to, though. No, I'm no, I'm just no, going to no, say no. this much. No, no, this no, guy, no. I'm just going to say this much. This guy wrote a book called Premonition, which is a marvelous book about, yeah. I, I mean, I love that book so much. It just goes in so many fa fascinating directions about what happened with COVID. But he writes a book called Premonition. And then he has a premonition that there's this guy <laughs> called Sam Bankman Fried. <laughs> and he might just, you know, make sort of an interesting subject. So he's hanging out with this guy when the whole thing explodes. Does anybody in here know who Sam Bankman Fried is? Of course they do. The whole, it is amazing. The whole world knows. He, I mean, he's just... Uh, but yeah, not, but, but I don't know, how did you just turn this conversation into something about me? You just did this is that jujitsu. Don't do that. This is we're here for you. Anyway, it's coming out in October, and I cannot wait to read no. it. <laughs> you just screwed me up. You completely screwed me up because I did, I wanted you didn't really answer my. We, oh. It is true. I'm with you on. Yeah. It's amazing what you find if you go looking and poking around the world. But but so but there are obviously going to be places in your books where there's just nothing, where you where you have. Well, to Well, that's generate. it. Well, if there weren't, I wouldn't be writing it because then it'd be a job for a narrative historian. Right. So the reporter in me wants the truth. Right. And it's only a novel 
if there are voids, if the, if the, the thread of fact right. frays and disappears, then there's a void for imagination to work. But you have to make sure it's an informed imagination. So at what point in your career did you realize you could fill that void with your imagination? First book, because I thought of doing the story of Eam as narrative history. That was what I knew how mm. to do. And then I go back to Eam, and duh, it's a, it's a village of illiterate lead miners and shepherds, so the only person who left any kind of written record is the vicar. Right. That's not enough. No. No. So book. then you have to think, how can I dive into this void and say, it might have been like this. Right. Yeah. I, I, have, I could just go on with you. And you could just go on with me, <laughs> oh. but I think we ought to let we ought to let we have nine minutes left. We ought to let people ask. I, I just want to just want to say, I had never it had never occurred to me that it's a real advantage if the person that you're trying to write about is confined to their room by an ankle brace. Yes. <laughs> well, this is and just, they're bored. <laughs> I would I would I was telling her that when you have a subject, when you have a subject who's a billionaire with a plane, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, because they say, I'll meet you in Washington, and you get to Washington, and, they, and they're in Beijing. <laughs> and, and, uh, but when you have a subject who is under house arrest within an, hour, an hour's drive from your house, it's, it's heaven. It's absolute heaven. Uh, I wish I had some in at the Department of Justice <laughs> so that it would enable me in the last stages of my books to just have my subjects arrested. <laughs> And, and held in confinement for me <laughs> until I'm done, and then you can let them go. Uh, but anyway, so like, does, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here have read your book already, and I'm sure people have questions they would like to ask. Oh, um, wow. And there are microphones there, but if you say to me, I, I can also repeat it for so everybody can hear. How about, how about right here? They're very keen in the front row. Very, they're, they're, <laughs> could, you, could you pull your question in there? <laughs> So Why don't you repeat the, the question? The question is, um, the racial theme in um, the mid-19th century is uh, obviously going to be a big part of the story. And then I'm writing a contemporary story. I can't possibly then leave it in the past as though, oh, yeah, well, that's all over and done with, and we don't have to bother our pretty heads with that anymore, because obviously it's not. And so I realized... Um, with a somewhat sinking heart, given the issues around a white writer writing black lives, but that I would have to address this and have it reverberate in the contemporary story as well. And so that's why that theme echoes and reverberates. Ah, uh, spoiler alert. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to entirely repeat that question, but it has, to do, it has to do with the fate of one of the characters. And I can, I can answer the question obliquely, and hopefully it will satisfy your curiosity. So um, there's a personal reason for the way things go the way they do, and there's a professional reason. And I'll start with the professional reason. So... I have a black protagonist in the 19th century, and I have a, a black protagonist in the 21st century. And when I was starting out in fiction, I read a really good how-to book, and I can't remember to my shame who the author was, but one of the things he said stuck with me, which is the novelist's job is to push the protagonist's head under the water throughout the book. But when you get to the end, you have to make a decision. Are you going to sink them or let them swim? And I'm a big fan of the swim because as a reader, I hate it if a writer has made you care passionately about a character for 350 pages. And on page 351, they push that character off the cliff. Yeah. I don't like that. No, no. <laughs> so most of my characters swim, but I realized that it would be untrue to the racial history of this country to allow both those protagonists to swim. So that's, that's part of the answer. And the other part was halfway through this book, my husband died suddenly. And my life went sideways. And I couldn't write at all for a year, but when I crawled back 
to this book because Tony loved this book. He did not like my last one because it was too far in the past and he didn't care about what happened in Second Iron Age Israel, but he really loved He actually said that. He yeah. said he didn't like your book. Yes. It's a, what a marriage. <laughs> What a I was telling you earlier, so he, I really miss him because he was a wonderful editor and very tough. And um, he would say things like, he would read something and he'd say, you should be embarrassed that our grandchildren will read a sentence that bad. <laughs> you know, actually, the, the spirit, now that the spirit of Tony is here, you know, he was brutally honest when he wanted to be. And, I, and I'm just thinking... He was a little unfiltered. A little un I just remember, you know... My version of this is when I would have dinner parties, uh, he would come to the dinner party and <laughs> eat very little of what I cooked. And he'd finally admit to me that every time he came to my house for dinner, he'd stop at McDonald's on the way because the food was so bad. <laughs> and, and, but now who tells me? He, I, I, it was, he was able to deliver these messages in such a charming way that we stayed friends <laughs> and you stayed married. Uh, he did have this incredible ability to not get signals, like he would be saying something really outrageous, like, you know, critiquing a story in the newspaper when the reporter was sitting at the other end of the table. <laughs> and I'd be going, and I'd be doing everything other than leap across the table and throttling him, but he would not get it. <laughs> you and I have both endured losses that people shouldn't endure in the last few years. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I want you to talk about, I wonder, you, your life went sideways when he died. I, I, I miss him every day. Hmm. I can only imagine what's in your heart. Um, did you think, I was so proud of you about this book because I, I, you, know, you, had it, that you had it in you still. Was there any part of you that thought maybe I don't want to write anymore? Uh, I, I got a good bit of advice, which w it, it came through, it was handed down through two iterations of women who had lost people, but it originated with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm. and she had told Nina Totenberg, who had told my friend Deborah Amos, uh, and Deborah Amos had lost her lovely husband around the same time as Tony died. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg had said to Nina Totenberg, do you work? It might not be your best work, but it will be good work, and it will be what saves you. Hmm. And it turned out that going back to my desk was the lifeboat that I crawled into, and I knew I wanted to finish the book just because I wanted to dedicate it to Tony. Right. Really. So, yeah. Did you find it different, putting your bum in the chair? Well, I think the, the second half of the book takes a, a dark turn, which is where I was leading to with your question, that I was so suffused by grief and loss that that sort of seeped into the story. But you never really lost the ability to put the words on the page. Well, it was a relief to be in a different head. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I found that since I went back to work, I'm... I, I was always a bit of a lazy writer, <laughs> and now I'm just, I'm unstoppable. <laughs> it's just all about work right now. <laughs> so we have, we have time for one more question. This front row, oh, wait, wait, so you were the, you were the, you no, were the we're kid let, at school let, that let's was go back. Missed. Let's go back at the back, just how about there? Yeah. What I like to read, okay. I just finished a book that I'm so enthusiastic about. Unfortunately, it's not out just yet, um, but when it is, um, it's nonfiction. It's called Wifedom. It's by an Australian writer named Anna Thunder. And it is about George Orwell's wife. <laughs> I can only imagine. You can't. <laughs> you cannot imagine. This woman was. Let me make a note. <laughs> a war hero in the Spanish Civil War. She was the most extraordinarily creative and brilliant person, and yet she's been completely erased, and her influence on Orwell is completely underestimated by his four, get this, four biographers, leave her out and minimize her role, and Anna Funda has excavated this woman's life, and it is just an extraordinary life and a riveting read. I just bolted through it. 
Do you, can you forecast, I know you're usually working with history, but can you forecast a time when my sex can cease to be embarrassed about itself <laughs> and, and, and its behavior? I think, that, I think that our kids' generation is doing a really good job on that. I, I love the way my sons are moving through the world. Good. Yeah. On that note, Geraldine Brooks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. You, sh you should know that books from all of our authors are, look over there, that's the next place to go and look for sale. Geraldine Brooks, Michael Lewis, thank you for a fabulous conversation. Uh